Welcome to the David Addison Show. I'm David Addison, and on my second ever show, I have my first ever guest. And if you're not familiar with his name, you'll definitely be familiar with his apps, Spectre and Halide. All the way from sunny California, Spence Sandowski. How are hey, you, Ben? Thanks for having me. Pleasure, pleasure. I'm really excited. And um, today I've asked you to join me because um, I need help. Like, honestly, I'm in some dire straits because for months now, I've been trying to research a iPhone photography um, video, like going to how it works. And I've been crawling through like loads of like documentation and watching loads of developer workshop videos at developer.apple.com. <laughs> and, uh, I'm just like, I need to speak to an actual human who does this stuff and can explain it to me in a way that I can understand. And I thought, who better to ask than yourself? Cool. Well, there is a lot to learn about the system. And even if you watch all the videos, there's no substitution for getting your hands dirty and trying to figure out all the stuff that isn't written down. So happy to share some of that today. <laughs> exactly. No, no, thank you. Um, I did once, I, I was going to say I did once dabble in code, but that's, that's a lie. I made something. I made... um. Many years ago, I made a snake game in Macromedia Flash. Uh, <laughs> that's how long ago it was. It was in action. It was with action script. And um, so I, I basically know, know absolutely nothing. So I'm very happy, uh, happy for you to be here and uh, school me today. Teach me. Well, the good news is most people are making it up anyway as they go along. So, uh, <laughs> so you're probably not that far behind everyone else. So, yeah, but happy to share... Uh, some of the deep secrets of uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. Any. Cool. So first, first question from a from a photographer's point of view, right? We we compose our shot just just like this, and uh, we tap the shutter, and then our image just appears on the screen as if by magic. But in that split moment, like what's actually happening inside the phone? So we tap the shutter. And then what's going on? So if you're coming from a traditional big camera, then you're used to pressing a button and then, you know, a shutter curtain opens and it uh, captures light for a split second, right? So if you're coming from the world of a regular camera, you probably have a mental model for how you think it works. And that's a little different than how it actually works on modern iPhones. So what's actually doing is it's taking multiple exposures in a fraction of a second. And it'll vary the type of exposure. So it might choose uh, one at a shutter speed of one one fiftieth, one one thirtieth, and then one one hundredth of a second. And then it will take these multiple exposures and then using machine intelligence, it figures out the best way to merge them together to get the, uh, the quality photo that you want. So that could involve noise reduction uh, where it's merging them together to sort of average out the noise. And again, that's similar to how a traditional photographer in the old days would lock their camera on a tripod, take multiple exposures, and then average them out in Photoshop. But the way that the modern smartphone cameras work is much smarter insofar as you're holding it in your hand rather than a tripod. And so uh, it's doing some of that. It's also selectively dodging and burning your photo based on the exposure in a scene. And so uh, dynamic range is a whole separate topic, but basically your sensor is able to take uh, a photo th uh, with values that are outside the range of what you can display on screen. And so what the camera app will do is it will dodge and, burns the dodge and burn the parts that will be overexposed or underexposed uh, in how it'll display on screen so that everything is sort of visible on the screen at once. So if you ever point your camera uh, if you've ever been inside and pointed it out a window and you've noticed that the window is blown out, modern cameras are smart enough to actually rescue the details in the window and merge it together into one photo. Um, and so <laughs> it's a lot smarter than what you're probably uh, used to uh, with a, even a digital camera of 2015 or even today, modern digital cameras like big cameras are incapable of this kind of intelligence. And hopefully <laughs> the smartphone make or uh, hopefully the camera makers will catch up based on what smartphone uh, uh, creators are doing. Yeah, absolutely. It seems like for, for years now, these uh, the, the phones have been ahead in the ways you're describing. Um, 
like I, I watch videos where it's like iPhone versus Ari Alexa and <laughs> straight out of the camera, at least that dynamic range and that tone mapping, as you say, is being done dynamically. Mm -hmm. Like, um, and I'm sure you know all about that. Um, we'll go, would you mind going a little bit deeper? Like, for example, what's the first like operation or instruction that happens within say Halide when I press that shutter? What? Which bit is how I, which bit of the hardware is how I communicating with within the phone? Sure. So the smartphone vendors have their own abstraction around the hardware. So they have their own frameworks. In the case of Apple, they call it AV Foundation. And this is your entry point for telling the camera system what you want it to do. So through AV Foundation, you say, I would like to start a video or a video session with the camera so that you can view it in the viewfinder. And then when it's time to actually capture the photo, uh, the app is telling AV Foundation, I would like to initiate a capture with these settings. And so there are affordances inside these APIs that uh, Apple provides where you can set different things like, I would like to create one with the most computational photography applied, where you can say, I want all of the noise reduction, uh, all of uh, the uh, dynamic range compression, all, all the bread and butter. Uh, or you could say, I just want it the fastest response with the least processing. So that's one way that we can say to the system, I'd like to take a photo uh, and uh, configure the output. It's also important that you go through these systems because it's the only way to say, trigger the flash at the same time as when you take a photo. Um, so some of it is just bound by hardware. And it's tricky because a lot of what they expose is an abstraction so that when Apple introduces you know, the next camera system in a year from now, you aren't expecting very specific, um, we'll say, uh, exposure duration ranges. So as an example, years ago, <laughs> uh, by that I mean 2016, the, the longest exposure you could take with hardware was I think a third of a second. Uh, and there are various reasons for that. Um, uh, part of it's thermal, that the longer you take a, a exposure with the sensor, the warmer it gets. But Apple would cap it at one third of a second or whatever vendor that makes the sensor would cap it at one third of a second. And then in modern iPhones, you can go up to one second of a hardware-based exposure. And hopefully uh, someday they'll get to longer durations. Some Android phones can go up to, I believe, four second long exposure durations. And so uh, you can't just hard code the value and say, okay, a maximum of one second because it'll break as soon as Apple releases the iPhone 13 or 14. So part of the trick is when you're talking to these frameworks, you at the time the app is running, you check, okay, what are the legit values that you can actually uh, access? And, and so uh, one of the tricks also is uh, you need to kind of future-proof your code. So as an, an, an example in Halide, we always checked dynamically what the maximum value is and so when Apple released newer hardware that went up to one second, Halide just worked without having to issue an update to change that hard-coded value. So if you do it right and you pretend that you don't know the actual hardware settings, then you can get away with a lot when you're talking to these frameworks. But then at the end, there's a dimension where you still, they, they still don't expose enough. So you kind of go in there and hard code like, as an example, um, the iPhone 12 Max Pro has a 2.5 zoom uh, telephoto lens, whereas the uh, other versions have a 2x. Apple doesn't actually tell you which devices are 2.5x versus 2x. So at the end, we still now have a hard-coded value saying, okay, if it's a Pro Max, display the icon that says 2.5 instead of 2. So you kind of have to cheat a little bit uh, with what Apple get, gives you. And then there's the things that they don't document. Uh, which has just been through trial and error. So uh, going back to what I said about computational photography and multiple exposures, it turns out if you enter manual mode on the camera and initiate a capture saying, I want one one fiftieth of a second, it looks as though the frameworks don't actually do a multi-exposure fusion uh, like it does when you're in auto mode. So if you look very closely at low light, you'll see a bunch of noise uh, uh, that's the direct result because it's not doing all the computational photography you asked. And there's nothing in the documentation that explains uh, uh, how this behavior works in manual exposure mode. So it's just a matter of trial and error. Um, yeah, and I think that's pretty much it. Uh, another tricky part is things like um, uh, focus distance, which 
so if you ever tried to take a close up photo, uh, like a macro photo, and you went to the telephoto lens, which is an intuitive thing a person would think uh, if they don't understand uh, optics and uh, uh, the relationship between telephoto and focus distance. But we've had requests from users like, hey, I set the camera to uh, telephoto and I can't focus at a closer distance than, uh, than the first party camera. And the reason for that is uh, the first party camera will actually switch over to the wide angle lens when you're trying to focus with something very close because uh, the wide angle lens has a closer focal uh, uh, distance or focus distance than the telephoto lens. And so if you actually take out your iPhone and you uh, try to focus on something close uh, and then cover up the telephoto camera on the back of your phone, you'll notice that it's not covered up. What the camera's actually doing is switching over to the wide angle and then cropping as if it were a 2x. And so um, what's nice is that Apple now uh, in iOS 15 will provide app developers hints as to the closest focal distance, focus distance of each camera. Uh, but um, until the trial and error there, you wouldn't know, okay, if you really want to zoom um, that close or if you want to get that close, you need to switch over the lens. And so we get pretty, every couple of days, we get an email from a customer asking, hey, why doesn't uh, focusing work and we have to figure out in the app how to properly present that to be a little less confusing to more casual photographers. Yeah, it must be quite challenging. There's so many variables, as you said, and uh, it's interesting how Apple don't reveal everything to you um, as developers. Um, I might be getting, um, God, you've covered so much. I have so many questions. I'm just, <laughs> I'm still trying to process it all. It's Absolutely fascinating. But um, you mentioned there, I heard you mentioned AV Foundation. Now, you Google or you, you search for um, iPhone camera app development, and the first thing that usually comes up is AV Foundation and APIs and stuff. And you, you mentioned how it's a framework. And could you just talk a little bit about, in layman's terms, like mm. what is that framework and just what an API is exactly sure. so uh if you've ever done any coding then you probably are you've probably used a print statement or you maybe displayed something on screen and if you've done any coding uh in the last 30 years you didn't need to understand what was uh, going on when you say print to screen or display uh, a square on screen and so the idea behind a framework um, that's bundled with the operating system is that it gives you a high level way of interfacing with a lower level system. So uh, it would be an analogy also of uh, if you're driving a car, you just put your key in the ignition and you turn it. You don't understand how the internal combustion engine works. You understand that by moving the steering wheel in the back of your head, you kind of understand the wheels are turning, but you understand drivetrains or, uh, uh, or the lower level details of how it's rotating the wheels. You're just steering it at a high level. And so the idea behind an API is that it gives a developer a higher level way of interfacing uh, with these systems. Uh, one, just because uh, it would be insurmountable for anyone to get anything done if you had to think about the lower level voltages being sent into <laughs> sensors and cameras. And also um, a, a secondary benefit of providing this interface, these, this code that you talk to instead of actually the, the, the lower level details, um, uh, it, it provides a, a future proofing of Apple that is, it changes the underlying things. You're just talking to this, you know, the, you're talking to the print statement as opposed to, you know, when they change the screen of the next iPhone or the, of your next Mac, uh, you don't have to worry about how it's getting those black and white values to screen as you want to print something in the terminal, right? So an uh, API stands for Application Programming Interface, and you code against that generally as opposed to the lower level details. Um, another example would be, you know, when you're talking to a network, if you've ever, in a web browser, uh, if you've ever done web development and you've had to make a call to load uh, a, a network request, uh, uh, from somewhere, you've talked to, they call it the ever-friendly XML HTTP request. Although if you're using a library like jQuery or whatever, I guess, I don't know, React uh, as networking, I don't do web development anymore. You usually talk to the library rather than the lower level, more confusing APIs. And then those uh, APIs that are built into the web browser 
are not talking to the network card, which is issuing high and low voltage values to talk to an ethernet cable, which is talking to the internet. And it would make your mind explode if you thought about all of these stacked abstractions on top of each other that make it easier for us to function at these high levels without understanding all the uh, details that's going on underneath. So an API is just a high level way of talking to lower level um, uh, systems. Gosh, the way you explained it then, it's, I'm going to, I'm, I can't wait to watch this back. I can just <laughs> take notes as you're talking. Um, that's the best explanation of an API I've ever heard. Usually you get the menu in a restaurant, the vending machine sort of explanation, but the way that, that car is, that's just such a great metaphor for it. That's amazing. Um, Thanks. and high, high level APIs versus low level APIs. I finally understand now, not obviously not fully, but I have an idea of, uh, of what direction to go in. And I remember like <laughs> some, a lot of people watch TV series and Netflix series these days. I, I binge watch old Apple keynotes from like years ago. And <laughs> I watched one recently uh, from 2010 where Steve Jobs introduced, um, iOS four and he introduced, um, he didn't specifically say it, but it was, it was the, um, the SDK for iOS four. It had like 1500 APIs in it. I'm pretty sure AV foundation was in there somewhere. And I just mm -hmm. find that I just find it all fascinating. Um, so you, you mentioned, um, are there some limits to Apple's APIs? Are you able to use, use your own APIs? And I think you, you've mentioned to me, um, previously about you had to use your own stuff for coverage in your app, which I don't think gets mm -hmm. enough attention by the way. I think coverage is fantastic. I've not seen any other app Thanks. that does coverage anywhere near it. So could you explain a little bit about that? Sure. Uh, so once you reach the end of Apple's APIs, then it's when you start putting together crazy workarounds or hacks or ways to sort of work around the limitations built in. And part of it could be hardware based where, so for backing up, the reason coverage exists is uh, unless you're using Pro Raw, there's no way to take a native Bayer Raw while also capturing all of the computational photography goodness that is available in modern iPhones. So uh, as I said before, you take a photo with a first party camera, it can do um, a huge dynamic range uh, capture and then compression for you so that your windows aren't blown out, right? And unfortunately, uh, by default, you're not able to both take a raw photo uh, and one of these processed photos with all of the goodness at the same time. And as I said earlier, it's because uh, although Apple doesn't tell you, it's because when you're taking um, a computational photo like that, it's doing multiple exposures in a row. Whereas by definition with RAW, like if you're taking a RAW, <laughs> uh, what good is it to have three separate RAWs uh, as if you're doing a stacked HDR photo if you don't have the algorithms to then create Apple's photo for you? So that's why Apple eventually released Pro RAW, where it gives you both their processed photo and then their their special raw that's like uh, uh, merged together and gives you more editing latitude. But if you're not on the latest, uh, uh, if you're not on a pro uh, phone, you don't have access to pro raw. And also there are compelling reasons to take a raw raw, a bear raw anyway. Um, you'll find, for example, in pro raw that they have lower, uh, if you want the absolute sharpest detail, you want to go with native raw because pro raw is ultimately stacking together images and they're doing an incredible job that you don't notice it. But if you really go in at a pixel level and look at the detail, the fact is if you're taking multiple exposures and stacking them together, you are losing just a little bit of sharpness. Um, Pro raws take longer to capture, uh, the files are larger, uh, and with native raw, uh, you can choose different processing algorithms depending on the type of photo you're trying to take. There's, there's a ton of compelling reasons to still take a regular native raw. And so uh, before they even announced ProRAW with uh, Halo Mark II, we introduced a feature uh, where it would take both a process photo and a uh, native RAW at once, well, at once, but it would really take a burst. So there is a slight delay. Um, so if you, cap if you have cap coverage enabled and you tap capture, and then you quickly move your phone, you're going to get two separate photos. But if you're in a patient situation uh, and you're taking a photo of a subject, uh, that isn't super fast moving, then you can take a capture that has both all the native process or all the uh, computational photography and an underlying raw to mess with later if you disagree with Apple's processing decisions. 
Um, so yeah, that's pretty much pro uh, coverage in a nutshell. It'll be very interesting to see its longevity with later generations of phones. Um, if it turns out ProRAW is coming to more devices, I don't think we would keep coverage there for forever if there's a native solution that does a better job. There's nothing I'd love better than to delete code that we don't need to use anymore. So maybe in five years, we'll just laugh about how coverage <laughs> was that feature that was a workaround. But for now, um, until ProRAW is available on all devices, it's nice for older phones uh, or modern generation phones that, phones that don't support ProRAW to give people that um, uh, uh, leverage when they want to edit a photo later. Yeah, um, you mentioned um, before about the, um, the the photos and manual settings. They don't get the, the HDR and the tone mapping and stuff. And um, it's um, it's not mentioned like anywhere. I I I found this out like by myself um, when I was comparing Pro Raw taken in auto and Pro Raw taken in manual. And I was like, what what's going on here? Um, why do you think it's not? mentioned like anywhere by anyone essentially uh i think it's as simple as uh most of the attention at any company goes to the features that impact the largest possible audience right and i would imagine most people are not photo nerds like you or me uh most of us aren't using the manual settings and i'll be honest like uh, very often, especially in a, in a high light situation where I can assume that the system will choose the lowest ISO, it's perfectly fine to choose auto exposure uh, most of the time until you have an explicit reason to go manual. Um, a good example would be if you want to really capture like a splash of water in the air or, uh, or you really want to get the lowest uh, light while you can lock your camera to something. Those are two situations you want to go manual. But Think about it like I wouldn't be surprised if 99.9% .9 of people out there never engage the manual controls. So it's as simple as uh, the what is it? The squeaky wheel uh, gets the grease. So because not enough people are shooting, there isn't enough demand among uh, manual photography apps. And in turn, Apple doesn't get enough bug reports or requests for more documentation. Um, so it's as simple as that. But I would say that uh, what's nice is Apple does at its annual developer conference, they offer lab sessions, which is you can book some time with the engineers at Apple that are developing these features that make their way into uh, the next version of iOS. And so it's just like a, a free time that you can sit there with a long list of questions like, hey, uh, why does it take a why is there a delay between setting exposure and it getting reflected to the viewfinder? So that was a question that we asked um, uh, earlier, and actually we're working on a new feature to improve uh, the responsiveness in manual exposure mode. Uh, and uh, it was just a matter of like talking to an engineer and, and then saying, hey, uh, it'd be super if you could update the docs and then filing a ticket in Apple's uh, bug tracker that's, you can publicly file tickets with Apple. Uh, it's uh, look up a feedback reporter. And in fact, even if you aren't a developer, you could file bug reports for weird behavior on your phone, and it will get visibility inside Apple among engineers. Uh, and so uh, it's just a matter of filing the paperwork and asking them to update it, and then waiting for the next version of iOS for it to be updated. And I would say there's been a number of features that um, as a result of requests, uh, we've seen better documentation. So for example, uh, inside uh, your viewfinder when you're capturing a photo, there's a sort of a pseudo HDR compression that takes place in real time where uh, if you turn it off, uh, and there's a way in the API to turn it off, you'll notice if you point your camera to a window, the window will be blown out. But it, there is real-time HDR uh, taking place in the viewfinder. And they, in a year or so ago, Apple documented what's actually going on, where your camera's actually taking two exposures in quick succession uh, in uh, its video feed, and then quickly blending them together. And so you'll actually notice uh, that if you were to capture uh, multiple frames of video with this HDR feature enabled, you'd notice there are gaps as your as objects are moving across the screen, uh, as if half the frames are missing. <laughs> and it was it was mysterious. If you look very closely, you notice it. But then in Apple's documentation, explain okay, it takes two exposures. One of them is uh, twice the exposure duration as the other, so it can do this real time HDR effect. So yeah, if if there is something odd, then uh, and you nag Apple, eventually they will update the docs. Uh, or if you post to their developer fo fo forum, sometimes uh, an engineer will pop in. But uh, it's just a matter of there's so much surface area now versus, you know, 10 years ago with the iPhone 4, 
uh, that it's just so much that needs to be documented. It's hard for them to fit it in and know what is the most important stuff to get out there. It won't be re- irrelevant in a year. You mentioned uh, right back at the start about how you, when they introduce new things like a new version of iOS or a new iPhone, that you're almost like future-proofing your app. So it's about that time of year again. Um, iOS 15 is due to have its full release uh, soon. And you've got just a couple of days ago, they announced um, their next event, the September event which is on the 14th at 10 o'clock Pacific Standard Time, which uh, I now know what that means, uh, which is <laughs> 6 o'clock here in the UK. So what, what, does that, what does this time of year typically entail for, for Lux? Uh, lots Nervous of Red Bull. Use. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so usually, uh, so the beginning of summer uh, is when Apple does its main developer conference, uh, WWDC, Worldwide Developer Conference. And that's when they announce some of the APIs around iOS, in this case, iOS 15. Uh, And they'll talk about, for example, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, they have that API that will tell you the closer focus distance of uh, of a particular lens. It's not a super sexy, exciting API, (laughs) but it's something that we get a heads up on uh, earlier. So we can think about, okay, do we want to get that into the next version of uh, the app? And usually if you read the tea leaves, you can figure out maybe the next camera will involve this or it'll involve that. So we can kind of preemptively plan, okay, if Apple launches a new type of camera in the next iPhone, uh, then uh, what feature would we want to quickly build? So usually in the first week or so of new hardware, we try to get out an update uh, to support the new hardware at a basic level. So it, it, I believe when Apple launched a device with th- three cameras, we were pretty quick to get that feature out in a week. Um, uh, balancing out, let's not release an update that causes everyone's app to crash, uh, which is the uh, risk of trying to rush these features out. But usually we figure out a baseline compatibility update early on so that people who, when they unbox their new devices, they get that really exciting fe- feeling of being able to take advantage of this new hardware and have fun on day one. And then over winter, uh, we're thinking about uh, a bigger update uh, or through the rest of the year, like, okay, knowing that this new feature is available, how can we really take advantage of this um, at a deeper level? So uh, in the case of last year, it was interesting because ProRAW was announced in fall and then it launched literally uh, a week or two before Christmas. So for us, it was, uh, they gave us about a month, they gave everyone about a month uh, between releasing a pre-release version of the APIs and us implementing them. So backing up, when Apple announces something like at the beginning of summer, they provide developers a beta version of the operating system and a beta version of the developer tools pre-release uh, for us to play around with, with the new APIs they're thinking of introducing. And so over summer, it's expected that developers will submit bug reports to Apple, uh, play around with the APIs and provide them feedback saying, hey, uh, it's great we can do X, but could you add a feature to do Y? And if the developers at Apple can fit it in before fall, then hopefully between the beginning of summer and end of fall, they'll add some additional um, features so it's easier for us to implement whatever they're launching. So. What's interesting in the case of last year is that they uh, announced ProRAW with their fall event, and then there was a three-month period between it uh, being announced and it being launched, but they didn't provide until about a month before the public launch the developer tools for us to experiment with ProRAW and make sure it was compatible. Um, And fortunately, though, uh, it was interesting between uh, them launching the public preview and us uh, implementing it. Uh, we were able to give feedback on some um, interesting color space bugs that we found in the API. Um, it was funny, the um, the raw processing that comes with the system, it was uh, it was in sRGB versus display P3. And so we were able to file some feedback there. And uh, they were able to, I think in a subsequent update, I think at the beginning of January, they worked out that small kink. Um, and so, yeah, so a lot of it is trying to figure out, okay, between December and January, How do we work around this color space bug so that when you load a ProRAW photo, it doesn't have this bizarre green tint uh, over that photo? Um, So lots of little things like that. And it's exacerbated how in December specifically, Apple shuts down the App Store for a week for the week uh, between, I believe, Christmas and New Year, 
or thereabouts. So if you do release an update and there is a bug, so let's say that we wanted to issue an update to fix this weird color cast on photos, and it causes an issue with non-pro raw raws to have a color cast in magenta, right? Uh, if we if we submit that update right before the iTunes shutdown, then you'd have all of that week of Christmas when people are getting their new phones and they launch Halide for the first time. All their photos have this weird pink color. What's wrong? And it's just a nightmare for managing support. So for us, a lot of it is risk assessment and figuring out, okay, we want to reward users. We want to give them this cool experience of this uh, uh, of these new features, but we have to balance the mature uh, perspective of let's make sure that it's rock solid. We've tested it so that uh, we aren't ruining things for everyone else. Um, and so a lot of what we've invested in the last year, especially, is uh, quality assurance and trying to automate some of our testing, um, making sure that as, as these uh, devices get more complicated and there's a larger number of devices. So like uh, here's I've, my uh, yeah. testing, <laughs> just a sample of my testing matrix. Um, yeah. <laughs> there's just so many phones now with so many combinations of hardware uh, that we have to test against. How do we make sure that as we're giving a feature for phone X that we don't cause a bug in phone Y? So that's really, uh, that's becoming the challenge more than anything is complexity. It's it's so interesting, and I'm not sucking up to you because you're here. You just have to go and watch any of my videos to know that this is the truth. Your your implementation of Pro Raw was was excellent. Like whereas, and it felt like you'd really um, thought deeply about it, and it was seamless. Um, whereas some others, not naming names, it felt like it was just tacked on, and it broke some other features and stuff like that. Um, anyway, thanks. Well, I mean, um, and I'll just say that. Both me and Sebastian uh, and even Rebecca, who's uh, we're all photographers. In the case of Rebecca, she's a bit more of a junior photographer and having fun learning. But, um, you know, before starting Halide, uh, both Sebastian and I were you know, tr also used to these traditional big cameras. And so we're very passionate about photography and we take photos. Um, you can even look at my Instagram years before Halide. I was uh, uh, having a lot of fun. So. Very much we find that if we don't love the results of the app, uh, if we don't find it good, then we won't ship it. And so I would say in the case of ProRaw, it wasn't just enough about checking off a box, but with all of our features, it's about, okay, would we actually use this feature? And honestly, if we didn't find ourselves using ProRaw, if we didn't think it was an amazing feature and we couldn't fit it into our workflow, we probably wouldn't bother shipping it in Halai. <laughs> yeah. So um, as an example, Right now, we don't also we don't support uh, uh, Zoom digital Zoom, so we let you switch over the hardware, the camera of your uh, uh, of the iPhone uh, to Zoom, but we don't let you do pinch to Zoom like in the first party camera because cropping is ultimately just upsampling pixels, and the system that's in place isn't all that smart about uh, zooming. Uh, it's better to actually, if you're going to crop a photo to zoom, bring it into uh, an app that can do like super resolution or it can do um, uh, better upsampling. So for us, we just would rather not ship something than actually put in the app that we aren't super proud of. Um, so yeah, just uh, make sure everyone on your team's photographers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the app that you want to use yourself, right? It's... Um... Mm -hmm. It's that sort of mantra. No, that's great. And that, that leads on to my next question. Um, you are a team of three, as you just mentioned, with yourself, um, Rebecca and Sebastian. So mm -hmm. I, maybe using ProRaw as, as an example, like when something like that comes along, I, am I understanding correct that Sebastian is more of the designer? So mm -hmm. maybe the icon might come from him, his side of things. How's that collaboration process sort of look around implementing new features like that? Sure. Um, so... On a product side of things, I think that um, we might come up with a feature at a high level or we'll agree on something that's super compelling as a ethereal concept. And then Sebastian is 100% design. So he will come up with a design in Sketch uh, or I think he's moved completely out of Photoshop. And so he'll do all the iconography. He will come up with uh, the design as a still image. And then it's up to me to take these image uh, images and make them something actually living uh, in the app. So, right. um, and so there is give and take though. So uh, after I will do a first pass of the uh, camera system implementation, I will shoot off a belt to Sebastian. We'll, he'll play with it in his hands. I'll play with it in my hands. We'll come up with revisions of the – he'll come up with a revision of the design, and I'll implement it really quickly, even in a version where 
the code is kind of throwaway. It's almost like a first draft where if I if I turn things just the wrong way, the app will crash. That's perfectly fine because this is really to prove that when you get the feature in your hands, it feels right. Uh, it's right. almost like with video games. You see a video game that looks really good in the still screenshots, but then when you play it, it's it's uh, it's slow and unresponsive. Cyberpunk. Uh, <laughs> and so for us, it's much more about uh, how uh, the feature feels in your hands as much as it is about these surface level uh, details there. Now, as I, as I mentioned earlier, um, so Rebecca uh, loves photography, although she doesn't have the same number of years of experience. Um, and although she has a background with some OpenGL, uh, she doesn't have the same like obsessive understanding of the lower level systems that's come from four years of me working there. So um, right now, a lot of the stuff that Rebecca does is uh, uh, not camera system specific. So um, some of the setting screens or some of the onboarding and some of the new exciting stuff that we won't talk about today. <laughs> uh, uh, she's uh, not working directly in the camera systems, but um, some other uh, uh, stuff. And so, uh, <laughs> but at the same time, we'll also do code review. So um, even if you don't understand some of the lower level features or some of the system there, it's also important having multiple developers to prevent. Um, so if you're working, like I said, on four Red Bulls, actually I'd probably <laughs> die if I had four, but if you're working late, uh, uh, because of a project, or just in general, you're, you're, you have your eyes focused on a problem long uh, for a long period of time. It's very common for developers to sort of spot each other, where you'll submit code to another developer just to give a second set of eyes on it. Uh, again, the mixed metaphors is like having a spotter at a gym. Um, so right. it's very common where uh, another developer will say, hey, there's actually a typo here. You meant it to be seven and you put down five. Right. And so code review is an ideal thing that you do, not always, but um, it's very common for developers to check each other. Or if I have an idea for a feature and I'm not sure about how to internally structure it, um, we'll run things behind, but past each other like, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. Uh, what do you think about this design? And um, yeah. And then uh, also providing perspective on things. Uh, uh, as someone who's a non-photographer, non-nerdy photographer with four different types of regular cameras, like uh, if we're trying to build a feature that's for more general photographers who are just getting started, it's really useful to have a uh, perspective of people who uh, aren't uh, total camera nerds there. So um, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a really collaborative process. And then we have a couple of part-time people that we work with. So for example, um, uh, we have Jackson Hayes who uh, he's right now in university uh, in Arizona, but he works part time helping produce some of our uh, videos. He produced our amazing iPad ad, uh, and uh, he's working on some cool new stuff that hopefully you'll see this fall. Uh, and then uh, we have a part time support person who's right now in Minnesota, who's helping answering our support emails. For the first, geez, three years, it was entirely Sebastian and I answering every support email, which uh, is useful. You want to be, you know, directly interfacing with the people who are using your app, but it, there mm -hmm. are certain diminished returns where if it's the same hundredth time you're answering the question, the reason you can't focus close is because it's the uh, wide angle lens <laughs> is the one yeah. you want to switch over to, <laughs> you know, at a certain point, we know that this is a problem, but we can't solve it as a developer. So it's helpful to have someone else who can patiently talk users through these things and also help um, as we get a bug report in. Uh, sort of provide that first level of uh, investigation so that uh, we aren't, you know, spending eight hours investigating a bug that turned out to be a user error or turned out to be a, literally a broken iPhone. We've had bug reports where they can't access uh, a device and it causes the app to crash because the system itself will uh, crash if one of the cameras on your device is broken. So like things like that, which are interesting as far as understanding the system is great, but if we focus entirely on tracking down these bugs ourselves, we won't have any time to build the next big feature. So um, a big thing that we've worked on the last year is figuring out how can we delegate some of these things and bring in part-time help to help with QA and to help with answering support questions and to do a better job than if we we're just sort of like a part-time support person. But at the same time, maybe we'll still do, you know, rotations on support or um, in this case, uh, uh, the person we worked with, with in support, Jamie, she will uh, compress all of the bug reports that we're getting in this week and say, you know, the number one uh, bug report has to do with that internal crash in iOS that we've been talking about, uh, where uh, uh, 
it's good enough to go off on a chain tangent, but there's actually okay. a process. <laughs> uh, 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 there's a demon, as it's called, uh, an internal pr a program inside of iOS, and it's responsible for saving photos to your camera roll. And we have discovered that for a fraction of a fraction of 1% of users uh, randomly, and it may not even be the same users, this internal program in iOS will crash. And when it happens, and this is code outside of our control, uh, it's not possible for any app to save to the camera roll a photo. And sometimes restarting the device helps, but there's nothing within our control uh, that can stop it, and we've reported it to Apple. And so um, part of what we've been doing is trying to mitigate it. So we built in a feature where if it fails to save to the camera roll, we save the photo inside of Halai. We call it rescue, uh, where oh, we yeah, save a copy me, yeah. until we've confirmed beyond the shadow of a doubt that the photo was successfully saved to the camera roll. Um, we're probably going to do a better job in an update to surface this to users. So it's we actually save their photo, but we don't make it visible enough of like, don't worry, your photo's not lost. We saved it somewhere. And so that had to do with a bug we were seeing a year or two ago where the camera roll wouldn't sync with iCloud. And so, um, uh, so we're on top of these bugs and trying to service them to Apple, but we wouldn't have any idea of the severity of these bugs if we didn't have someone who is creating reports for us and tracking the numbers. And, uh, you know, it's number one in our tracker now, and we're still working on mitigating these things. Uh, and then comp composing very apologetic emails explaining, we think that this will be fixed in iOS 15, but there's nothing inside of our control that we can do. Um, so, yeah, so that's mostly uh, how our team makeup is, I think. One of the most fascinating um, accounts I follow on Twitter is called Internal Tech Emails. And I just find it mind blowing how many of like world changing decisions have been made with some executive going, maybe we should try this. Or, have you thought about this? Have you ever had like, what's the best thing that that's in Halide that's come out of, you know, maybe have you considered this, you know? I think a lot of what we've, built into Halide that's gotten a lot of positive response has entirely been, hey, wouldn't it be cool if we tried this? Um, yeah. So as an example, uh, our level guide, uh, which is a rule of thirds uh, guide, and then uh, a level, uh, the level part where it lights up uh, and uh, it's uh, responsive like that, that was mostly just us jamming. And I, I think I just threw in the, it, the haptic of it when it lines up, that's when we give the haptic, right? And so that was entirely just Sebastian and I jamming on an idea. And I would say that especially at large companies or companies that wish they were large companies, uh, the way that they develop product is through analytics and by measurement exclusively. Uh, so they will try a feature out and see how many people click on a button and then, uh, or they'll see what color button should we choose. Um, in the case, Google is infamous for the 40 shades of blue, where they needed to choose the right color for their AdWords uh, uh, ads. And they, they rather than work with a designer to come up with a nice blue, they tested 40 different variants on their website and measured how many people clicked on each version. And the one that got the most clicks won. Wow. And... There are certain, a very narrow set of problems where that makes a lot of sense, uh, where you can objectively measure uh, something like that. Uh, uh, but as far as developing a product that's largely based on intuition and feel, it's not only silly, but kind of depressing for me. <laughs> it's like people making a movie by trying to set it in front of a focus group and saying, what do you want to see in a movie? And like you talk to a writer and they would, you know, they would just give up on writing if they had to design by committee. Yeah. And so we very much, you know, the best metric for whether something is working or not is how many people are signing up and paying us. <laughs> so, you know, that's one way of measuring. And even that can lead you down dark paths where if you just focus on money first, uh, then you end up compromising your product and you don't see these secondary effects. And so another example would be, let's say you want to get someone to click on a button of a feature. Uh, well, I've seen in apps, they put a button in the upper left and I'm like, okay, people are going to click on that just because they'll accidentally tap on it. They'll be tapping back, 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 and then they'll accidentally tap that button. It will bring up a sheet and then they'll measure a click, right? So yeah. you can be led astray pretty easily if you're being driven 
purely by numbers. At the end, you need some form of intuition. And so Apple is interesting in that for many things, not everything, but for many things, they go by their gut as opposed to uh, a measured approach. Now, the App Store, I'm pretty sure they'll they that's much more analytics driven than other parts of Apple. But they will say, uh, OK, wouldn't it be cool if we did X? It just feels right. Uh, we're just going to do it. And if it works, we'll see it immediately by more users using this feature. Um, so, yeah, so pretty much, uh, yeah, we're just kind of making up it as we go along. But again, the flip side is we also need to balance that by getting uh, uh, more perspectives from people who are not like Sebastian and I. And so certainly in the last year and uh, in the coming year, we're going to be continuing to sort of make Without compromising the core of Halide, looking at these rough edges, looking at users and um, where they where we could do better by certain things in the app. And just because we love our app right now, we can't discount that we could be making the app better for everyone else by just sort of listening to people and uh, getting their feedback and figuring out what they really need. Uh, but um, I guess what uh, the insufferable quote of uh, if uh, Henry Ford said that if he asked people what they want, he just uh, they just get a faster horse. Yeah, uh, exactly. So you need to balance it out um, where you need your own intuition, but you aren't driven by external um, uh, numbers. No, absolutely. Um, and I mentioned in my review of um, Halide Mark II, God, almost a year ago now, wow, how like you do a really good job of... Um, balancing that great experience for beginners with something pros can enjoy um and mm -hmm. that's um it's really evident and from what you've said here today it makes a lot of sense that you thanks well you know I, I it's great talking to you because you know i saw your first video well over a year ago and i'd say that you know uh, your production quality is amazing the depth <laughs> of detail of your reviews is amazing and so uh in many ways i would say that among uh, uh, people in this space who are independent and don't have huge budgets, certainly, you know, you have some of the best videos that cover photography at such a deep level. And clearly, I'd say you're just as passionate about photography as we are about making camera apps. And so it's really great, you know, talking to you and uh, uh, please keep producing those amazing videos. Uh, it's much cheaper than us paying to produce them ourselves. Like, <laughs> in a way, they're wonderful advertising, even for, you know, even for any criticism, which is completely fair in all the apps, I'd say that your uh, uh, videos are amazing and I love sharing them among the team. So, uh, yeah, keep doing it, man. <laughs> I, I hope you all hear that, guys. Did you just hear that? Um, <laughs> it's funny you should have mentioned budget. Look at my microphone. It's sellotaped to a gorilla pod. Have you seen it? <laughs> that's, uh, that's the level of my budget. Um, no, um, thank you so much for that. Um, it's interesting you should say that because a lot of my stuff happens by accident too. Like... Um, you know, um, I might accidentally, um, recently I set the blend mode on a, on a layer to, to darken and it produced this really mm -hmm. cool effect and people complimented me on it. And I'm like, yeah, that was really on purpose. That was me that, um, <laughs> uh, our focus or our, uh, our focus feedback, when you tap to focus in the app, there's this interesting animation where the where the borders kind of shrink at the same time they're expanding. And that was entirely mm -hmm. a bug. And then I showed that to Sebastian and he's like, that's pretty cool. I'm like, yeah, let's keep that in there. <laughs> that, yeah. that looks pretty cool. So, you yeah. know, the trick is then you have to pretend that it was entirely, yeah, we totally, we sat there with onion skin and drew that out <laughs> and then we got a pixel perfect and then implemented it. Uh, you know, now a lot of it is just like a happy, happy accident. Yeah. <laughs> Sooner or later, someone will figure it out and it'll all come crashing down, Ben. It'll just, it'll oh, yeah. just be two hacks. <laughs> uh, this will be the undoing of both of us. I just won't even release <laughs> this. Uh, <laughs> oh, cool. Um, so I think those are my, uh, those are my initial seven uh, questions that I had. And I did take some questions from uh, some of my viewers. So this is from... Um, Alex on Facebook, and it alludes to something that you, you just mentioned, actually. Um, why does uh, Halide adjust your exposure when you tap to refocus? Don't you adjust the manual settings? Uh, that's as simple as that. One, it's the behavior of the first party camera. Uh, so that was the starting point. And the problem is, so there's an assumption that more features is better, right? But let's say that you wanted to focus separately from exposure. What would be the UI that you would implement that? Well, maybe you could have a button that says 
enable expo exposure f uh, metering only or a button that says enable focus only. And so in order to give an additional feature, you'd need to have some kind of affordance obvious in the UI as to how to separate manual exposure from uh, focus uh, focusing, right? Or uh, exposure metering from uh, uh, focusing. And so I wouldn't say that we won't ever build that feature, but it's, uh, it is such a low priority and such a low request from users that it's like way, way, way down the stack, uh, especially with some of the stuff that we're really more ambitious uh, stuff that we're planning in the future. Um, you know, at the same time, there is some low hanging fruit that we want to give a, an update, hopefully on um, small little things, not specifically that, but little uh, things that people we've gotten requests from users around, um, which I won't go into because we don't pre-announce features. But yeah, it, it is as simple as, yeah, we've, we've known people uh, every so often people request it. But honestly, it's not so much that it's worth outweighing the complexity it would add to the UI until we solve that problem perfectly. Uh, so maybe someday. Cool. And this is like the fifth or sixth time you've mentioned uh, new features that you can't talk about. I am I am keeping mm -hmm. track, just so you know. You're okay. Being, your, your poker face is very good. Um, so uh, go on. Oh, no. I mean... Um... It helps to have a, a, a co-founder who's ex-Apple, <laughs> who uh, we very much, um, there's a reason you don't want to pre-announce features for a few things. Um, and for a few reasons is that we will very often, and we talked about earlier, there's these happy accidents um, where you'll find out that you're building something and it doesn't work the way you intended. And then you want to pivot it in a slightly different direction. So just by not saying we're going to commit to uh, feature X, we may actually discover once we build feature X, we don't like that feature. And in fact, if mm -hmm. we take a bit of it and reuse it, uh, we can come up with feature Y that's even better. And people actually, the thing that people were actually asking for, um, and so, you know, part of it is to give flexibility and to avoid hard deadlines. And also, you know, we do get excited when we launch a feature, but we don't want to build up too much uh, hype around something until we're sure exactly of how good it's going to be. And we try to temper it. Uh, you know, we don't launch a feature unless we're excited about it, but we don't say uh, from, uh, we don't say in advance, you know, we're going to build this photography game. That would be a good example. Mm -hmm. We joke about it sometimes. Man, wouldn't it be cool to build like a game around photography? Uh, it is nowhere on our roadmap uh, and yeah. would never be the type of company to do an early access uh, uh, kind of feature or to launch, talk about something six months away just because uh, then it, you lose that ability to say we don't want to ship something. On the flip side, it is a little disheartening that you know, we're really hard at work on new things and people don't understand how much we're working on things. And they just, in this vacuum of news uh, uh, about what we're working on, um, if we go a while without an update, we'll say a couple months, occasionally in the app store, we'll get a negative review saying, hey, have you abandoned Halide? And like, <laughs> we actually would get that for months before our big Mark II release, which took 18 months of development. And wow. when we were working on Mark II, we were also doing small updates to Halide just to sort of quell the anxiety of, oh, are you abandoning Halide? And so it's a difficult line to walk where if you give people these small updates that, just to show them that you're, you're, you're still working on the app, they don't get excited. It takes months to develop something that's like a real home run that people go, oh, my God, that's amazing. But then if you don't do an update, then people worry. And it's, it's this odd balancing act that's – endemic to the app store itself and this is the way people are used to app updates literally every two weeks which is kind of kind of ridiculous to me <laughs> yeah yeah but, you know you handled the uh the lead up to halide mark 2 like perfectly i think you i think you started cryptically tweeting screen shots in june of like little corners mm -hmm. of the ui and stuff like that and they would slowly slowly get more likes and more likes until finally bang Someone messages me on Instagram. Mark II is out. <laughs> so, uh, oh yeah, it's very much like a, a big Hollywood release. You wouldn't just uh, drop the new Marvel film on a Friday and be like, "Come and get it." So it's <laughs> yeah, also yeah. kind of fun to play around like that. And uh, mm -hmm. you know, it's there's a fine line between overhyping and having fun and making it a big update. Like same thing with Apple. They've got their event next week, and they probably won't release the phone for a month. But they're going to be mm -hmm. doing a lot of work around giving pre-review uh, units to uh, reviewers or pre-release units. 
so that in that final week up to the launch, uh, uh, everyone's really pumped for that big uh, new update. And so it, I think that's a kind of part of the, the the app itself. It's not just this utilitarian thing. It's the excitement around getting something new and shiny and unwrapping it on Christmas Day, right? Christmas yeah. is nothing if it weren't for that month leading up to Christmas. Um, exactly, so we'll do yeah. that, but – we have to wait until we're really, really confident uh, that we're going to deliver on uh, any kind of dates or what we're putting together or or that we're going to tweet that screenshot and be not be like, oh, that button, let's pull it out there. We actually <laughs> – we uh, this is uh, – if you have a sharp eye, you'll see in some of the iPad ads that we launched uh, in advance – a bit, little bits of the UI are in slightly different positions, but it's a blink and you'll miss it thing because uh, right. it's like sort of the sizzle reel part of it. Um, so uh, for the most part, though, our, our, our marketing push is pretty uh, identical to what actually gets launched. But occasionally we aren't perfect. <laughs> cool. Um, so this is uh, from Greg on YouTube. Have you considered adding a burst mode to Halide? Definitely. That's higher up on the list, I'll say. Um, but again, uh, it's just a um, doing it in uh, the right way. Even if we aren't the first ones to launch something, we'll we'll do it in the right way. But it's definitely up there. Um, something also to consider is, you know, even if you want a burst mode, you have to ask like, okay, what does that actually mean? Um, you know, so for example, you tap capture uh, on the capture button. By default, uh, the camera will do an uh, will do a focus before it does that first capture. So I think at this point, and you actually see this in our um, XDR analysis, uh, with uh, when you're tr capturing RAW and you switch over to manual exposure, we actually update the histogram uh, and the zebras to look at the RAW frames that are coming in through the camera system. And so that is really tricky because uh, RAWs by default could take like a half a second, and that's too unresponsive to, as you're scrubbing, get any kind of meaningful feedback. So step one was building something like the XDR feature that allowed us to, I would say that we are capable of streaming RAWs faster than any other uh, app in the App Store. But now it's just a matter of something like that. It would be like, okay, would it be useful to uh, our users? And how could you represent it in the UI without making Halide feel like an airplane cockpit? We could tomorrow mm -hmm. drop in a button that says enable raw burst, but how would you do that uh, in an elegant way that doesn't confuse people the first time they use it and progressively disclose it? So, um, you know, it's if you if you want a feature like that, um, then just uh, ping us, let us know. We listen to users and we can bump it up higher or lower in the priority. But I'll, I'll also say with some of the stuff we're working on right now, uh, <laughs> not to again. overhype it, but... <laughs> Again, it'd be like if you look at some of the stuff that we're trying to build versus something like broad marketing capture, we only have three developers. And I assure you the stuff that we are working on, you'll be much happier getting that sooner than a raw burst. Uh, that's how that's how we, we think of things, at least, is I know it sucks that we have to wait for all these features you've asked for, but you're still going to be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. What 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 is that other feature? I eh, forget about it. Um, but, yeah, just keep us, uh, uh, you know, just gently prod us. Uh, you can you can. Follow us on uh, Twitter and on Instagram. So I guess that's one way. Uh, or you can email support um, uh, for requests. And uh, we'll definitely pay attention to it. Um, but uh, yeah, it's on our radar. Cool, cool. Um, from Jess on Instagram, uh, is it possible? I think you, you actually went into this a little bit before. Um, is it possible for developers to tap into the Night Mode API or is that being uh, kept locked down by Apple? That is the number one thing when we were talking to Apple engineers over summer uh, during the labs. Uh, they asked us if there's any kind of request we have from them. And I just repeated over and over again, night mode, uh, night mode, night mode, night mode node. And so it is not right now available as uh, to third party, party developers. But I will say, um, aside from that, Apple is amazingly um, responsive to feature requests. So uh, as an example, ProRaw, the fact that ProRaw launched in the first party camera at the same time as with third party cameras it was amazing. Like um, contrast that with something like when they launched their depth APIs with the iPhone 7 Plus, it was, I believe, a year between them launching it with the first party camera and it being able to third party developers. So part of it is Apple, just there's only so much they can do. Uh, 
as much as Apple's one of the largest companies in the world now, they still operate on small, nimble teams. So uh, they will get a feature out, but there's only so many hours. Like again, ProRaw launched weeks before Christmas. So it's clear they're working down to the wire in it. So um, I wouldn't be surprised if night mode eventually comes or if there's some kind of extenuating circumstance specific to the way they implement it that would be difficult to expose it to third party apps. Um, as an example, um, and this isn't this isn't a one to one uh, correlation, but um, people ask why is it not possible to capture a native raw and a depth photo at the same time, and the reason for that is depth photos are fusion between a telephoto uh, lens and the wide angle lens, and when they create the depth photo, it crops out the wide angle data. It uses the two lenses to uh, to much like the human eye create a depth image, and then you know it crops out the the it to just the part with the depth data. Now, one of the concerns about if they just open this up to raw is that it okay one you need to take two photos together, and then what uh, so you'd actually need two raws to reconstruct the depth data. But also there's a privacy implication of having a raw for the wider wider angle lens. Well, then it would be possible someone takes a, a portrait photo and uh, they aren't wearing any pants, right? The classic newscaster uh, joke, right? And so wouldn't it be awful if, you know, then you don't realize stored in your camera roll as a photo of you in your underwear, right? Um, so, so that's just like this interesting – and it's an interesting privacy question, right? How much data should you uh, leave available to third-party apps that may not be smart enough to do the right thing uh, or to have these considerations in their UI, right? Because if a third-party app uh, captures this data, but they don't service to the user that there's this sensitive data in their camera roll now, then that's a whole privacy kerfuffle waiting to happen. But so anyway, that's just like an example of some of the extenuating circumstances that you can't document. So even though Apple wants to expose it to uh, third-party devs, it's not, you know, available. And so for all we know, night mode could have some kind of extenuating, not necessarily privacy problem, but some kind of obscure thing that we don't know that Apple isn't sharing. You, you mentioned privacy there. One one uh, last question that I have is um, in iOS 14, um, no, I will rephrase this. Um, the new photo sharing app Glass, it doesn't ask you for permission to access your photos. And I found out it it's using Photo Picker in iOS 14. Could you do you know anything about that? Uh, sure. So uh, in iOS 14, they introduced an API. Um, I haven't played around with Glass yet, but uh, I think I know what you're talking about. Um, and so in iOS 14, they introduced an API. Uh, Apple uh, uh, gave the ability to let users pick photos without granting an app full access to your camera roll. So prior to iOS 14, when you say give access to my photos, any app could then go through your photo library dating back since you installed iOS 10 years ago. And it's also a little scary now with um, things like uh, device-side machine learning, where we wrote about this on our blog a few years ago, you could actually run on your iPhone uh, a machine learning vision model they could actually go through your camera roll and see how many photos of Coca-Cola have you taken photos of, and then report back to Pepsi, this is a Coca-Cola user, right? And so it would be this creepy way of looking through your camera roll and collecting information that you don't realize you're exposing. Or um, here's another classic example is that photos uh, have GPS data attached to them. So it'd be very easy hypothetically to create a map of all of the locations you go to over the course of a week and see, oh, you're in downtown. Well, there's a, no Joe, there's a new Joe and the Juice opening. Let's show you more ads for the one that's opening in your area, right? And so you do have to be a little uh, reticent about granting a camera, like, oh my God, Instagram or Facebook, eesh, giving them full access to your camera roll because uh, you are inviting a very rude guest to your house who is going to go look through your medicine cabinet, <laughs> right, or other creepy things. So um, with iOS 14 now, um, developers can opt in to letting users pick and choose individual photos through this picker, which is entirely handled by Apple. So when this picker floats up on screen, the developer isn't presenting that. That is a control that is provided by the operating system. And so the app just gets this black box 
response of here's the photo the user picked. You don't know how many photos are there. You don't get any other photos, just this one photo they handed you. And so uh, I think that's what's going on there. So are they looking at hashes or are they actually seeing the actual photos that you're taking when you give them permission? When you give an app full permission to your camera roll, they can load every JPEG. Uh, they can load all the metadata. It is basically like opening, giving them the keys to your photos app on your Mac. Every wow. photo is uh, visible. They could upload it. They could hash it. Um, uh, they can't delete it without getting permission, but that's about it. Wow. That's something you don't even don't even realize and here's me with like a million camera apps on my on my phone because because of what i do on youtube Jeez, cool well ben thank you for for that lesson you 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 took me to school it was the most enjoyable lesson i think i've ever had um i could listen to you for like another hour um the more i listen the more i I appreciate like what you do and the more i want to learn and uh, the more I learn, the more value I can bring to my YouTube videos and now to this podcast. So like, thank you so much for being here. Well, thanks for having me. All right, guys, that was my full conversation with Ben. It's literally just finished. Uh, Ben's gone off to enjoy his day. We talked for literally over an hour. It's like it's 20 past seven here for me now. It will be 20 past 11 for him in uh, California, the Bay Area. And uh, before we hit record, he was telling me what the Bay Area is. So now I know that, and I've learned what's and, I, and I've learned what PST is now as as well as Pacific Standard Time. So when someone says ten PST, I now know that means uh, six o'clock uh, where I am in the UK. And um, wow, it's like it's so so warm here in England today. I'm just like. I'm so I'm full of specular highlights. I'm so hot. Look at my red face. Ben looked like smooth and cool. He's probably got air conditioning. We don't have air conditioning here in England, um, so I'm just um, I'm just like melting here. And he's got his uh, his super cool setup, annoyingly soft, perfectly spread lighting. <laughs> so let me know if you uh, what you thought of our, of my conversation with Ben. I hope to have uh, more guests on, um, more app developers like anyone in this um, iPhone photography space. I'm really enjoying uh, doing this uh, podcast so far. I'm sure my uh, my interview skills, I'm sure I will upgrade. Maybe when I get a sponsor, I'll upgrade this monstrosity of a, of a microphone. <laughs> it's literally sellotaped to my uh, to my Joby Gorilla um, Handy Pod, whatever it's called. Um, so, yeah, like, leave... Um, Leave me your feedback wherever you listen to this. Um, drop me a review on the Apple Apple Podcasts and on YouTube as well. And yeah, I'm going to sign off now. I'm going to. Um, I I would like to comment more on what Ben told me and um, I carry on talking for a bit about what Ben told me and reflecting on it. But there's so much information. As I said to him, I'm going to have to go back and what rewatch this and pause it and make notes and reflect that way because it was like after every sentence i wanted to ask him a question but i didn't want to interrupt so um i think um when i see interviewers interrupting i don't like that so i will just let someone talk but the downside of that is i um i you know there's so much stuff that you want to ask and you have to pick carefully and you think okay i'll definitely ask you about that but then he says something else and you're like, okay, I'll definitely ask you about that. And then you're kind of trying to focus on what he's saying, but you're trying to formulate a question at the same time. And I don't want to make any notes while he's talking because it looks, it looks rude. And yeah, I'll get my, I'll get my uh, stuff together. Wow. It's so, so warm here. It's like been 31 degrees here in England today. It's very hot. September, like I'm waiting for it to cool down, but it will be, uh, the sun will be setting uh, sooner the sun's setting a lot sooner now so i can do some do some light trails a lot easier without having to wait until midnight get some sunrises without having to get up at like half four in the morning <laughs> so there is that right i hope you enjoyed this second episode of the david addison show i have already been hard at work on the third episode and we've got the fourth episode as well not of the david addison show but of the iconography podcast which is where myself and my um my co-hosts greg and dave i'm david Greg, Dave, we'll, um, we'll go into the reaction of the upcoming Apple event 
and then I'm going to also do a show on elitism within photography and sort of outline different types of elitists, what to look out for, and also go into why I think they act the way they do. It might not be for the reasons that you expect. I might take it in a different direction than um, is typically taken, because yeah, there's been a lot of discussion about elitism, a lot of articles written on it and stuff, and I think uh, I've got a, a fairly unique perspective on it. So stay tuned for that. It's going to be coming up either episode three or four, depends, because... You know me, I like to go into detail, so let's see when that one's going to be ready. All right, guys, take care. Thanks for listening. Uh, I need to sign off for this podcast that doesn't sound similar to my YouTube videos, but for now I'll use my YouTube video sign-off. Take care, stay curious, and pekarund. Pekarund, by the way, means see you soon in Romanian, because my wife is Romanian. But it's going dark for me, so I'll say nabdebuna, which means uh, good night. <laughs> Or I could say, never down the dimenatza, which means I'll see you in the morning. Visa plakute, sweet dreams. <laughs> see you in the next one.